juntos e em diálogo com os outros anteriores. Estes eventos continuam um percurso que temos vindo a fazer no TBA em torno de ideias e genealogias do experimentalismo, com vista a melhor compreender o momento presente. Trata-se de, transnacionalmente e atentos às viagens das ideias, como das práticas, formas de vida e modos de fazer, dar a conhecer episódios e lugares-chave do experimentalismo nas artes performativas entre a década de 1960 e hoje. A partir de arquivos e de experiências concretas, temos viajado então entre diferentes geografias e tempos, conhecendo e discutindo inovações formais, como a suposta primeira black box na Europa, a disseminação da ideia de criação coletiva, o foco na interdisciplinariedade ou no processo em vez no produto, procurando entendê-las política e esteticamente nos seus contextos de origem e questionando a sua operacionalidade hoje. So, Yanis, since 2019, Histórias do Experimental has been looking at the performing arts from a genealogical, contextual and transnational point of view, understanding statics and politics as deeply intertwined, and inquiring into traveling ideas and practices, questioning dramaturgic contaminations. At stake, there are forms of life more than artistic than artistic formats. Hoje, temos o prazer de ter aqui connosco Yanesh Yansha, cujo trabalho incide sobre a relação entre a arte e os contextos sociais e políticos que a rodeiam. De 1998 a 2021, Yanesh Yansha dirigiu a MASCA, um instituto de edição, produção artística e educação sediado em Ljubljana, na Eslovénia, no âmbito do qual editou uma série de livros sobre dança contemporânea e teatro, sendo também, entre 1998 e 2006, editor da revista do mesmo nome especializada em artes performativas. Yanez Yansham dirige presentemente o programa de Solo Dance Authorship da University Center for Dance, em Berlim, onde também ensina. Em 2007, juntamente com dois artistas eslovenos, alterou o seu nome para o nome do atual primeiro-ministro esloveno, conhecido pelo seu extremo conservadorismo, que então ia já no seu terceiro mandato. Juntamente com Yanes Yansha, Yanes Yansha é, proprietário, é proprietário da marca registrada Yanes Yansha. <risos> registrada. Um, hoje, falarmos da, da performance Pupilia, Papa Pupilo e os Pupilchecks, que foi originalmente apresentada em 1969 por um grupo de poetas, artistas plásticos, músicos e amadores, e que Yansha, Yansha reconstruiu em 2016. Por ela e com ela se discutiram questões filosóficas, estéticas e historiográficas que tal gesta carreta. Em particular, um questionamento maior sobre a nossa relação, sempre contemporânea com a história. No final, abriremos para a conversa, estando desde já convidados a participar pelo chat no Zoom, YouTube ou Facebook. Eu recolherei as questões, clarei alto quando houver oportunidade. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigada, Yanes. Thank you, thank you, Ana, for the invitation in this. Uh very important uh, context and programmation that you're doing. Recording in progress. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Yanesh, it's, uh, I, I give you uh, the voice, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation uh, to <clears throat> this important series uh, of uh, um, talks that you are organizing. And um, tonight I would uh, uh, like to talk about uh, experimental scene or experimental practices in uh, former Yugoslavia, uh, focusing on a case study. Uh, because I think it contains many aspects of a uh, very, as very wide range uh, of uh, <clears throat> experimentation uh, that took place in theater, uh, understood in a very wide uh, sense. Yeah? So maybe just like a, a, a little historical remark, uh, I will talk about uh, former Yugoslavia, so the country that doesn't exist uh, anymore. I will talk about very distant period, uh, 1969. Uh, and also uh, I will talk why was and why is this performance uh, relevant in a such a way that one would actually uh, reenact or uh, reconstruct it. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, the fact that uh, the performance 
uh, took place uh, in the in the 19th, towards the, the end of 1960s, 60s in former Yugoslavia, it doesn't come uh, as a surprise. Yeah, uh, Yugoslavia, as you know, was not part of uh, Eastern Bloc. It was not part of the Soviet bloc, uh, and it placed uh, her it placed itself somehow uh, out of uh, this Cold War tension. Also. Uh, being one of the uh, founding members of non-alignment movement, which was bringing together uh, many countries, uh, mainly third world countries, uh, that were out of uh, <clears throat> the Cold War uh, um, uh, conflict or the Cold War uh, <clears throat> relation. Uh, Yugoslavia was open and particular in that period of time, uh, this openness resulted also uh, uh, not only towards uh, <clears throat> uh, different parts of the world. Uh, it's very important to uh, mention here that as with the Yugoslav passport, you could travel both to the East and West and also third world countries without uh, particular difficulties with visas and so on. Uh, and uh, it is also the period in which the country itself opened, mainly through tourism, but also through, for example, experimental uh, theater uh, and experimental music. And, uh, for example, in the very early 60s, uh, very important uh, music biennale was established in Zagreb, the capital of Croatia today. Uh, and uh, in 1967, uh, the theater festival uh, BTF was established uh, and it's still operating uh, these days, uh, being one of the uh, first festivals of a kind and being one of the very few festivals that uh, in the world that could bring uh, performances both from East uh, and West, but also from uh, other areas uh, of the world. And in that sense, the information about uh, what is going on in the theater uh, at uh, in the world in that time was firsthand, at least for those who could attend the theater. This is also important to understand politically because you somehow uh, want to show that you are different authorities, communists in former Yugoslavia, wanted to show that they are different from uh, those in uh, uh, in Eastern uh, uh, Bloc. So one perspective that uh, we should look uh, from is this, let's say, liberalization uh, that, of course, didn't happen uh, only top down, uh, the communist thinking how to actually make uh, image of a country different from uh, uh, the other uh, uh, communist uh, countries, but also um, <clears throat> uh, bottom up. It's uh, as as uh, student uh, protests and student movements were happening in different parts of mainly Western uh, world. Uh, the same uh, was uh, going on in um, in former Yugoslavia. There were very uh, strong uh, movements, including riots with the police, including occupation of uh, universities. Uh, where student demands uh, were going towards uh, more equality in society. And of course, there are other uh, aspects, but mainly that, because uh, what became clear uh, 20 years after uh, the end of Second World War and establishing of a new uh, uh, country, uh, that there were uh, elites uh, developing, and it was... Uh, uh, social and class distinction uh, visible, uh, and that was certainly not something that was uh, uh, programmatically uh, meant when the, uh, the new country was uh, uh, established. Yeah? So <clears throat> uh, this a little bit uh, 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 as a context, uh, talking about then uh, uh, experimental uh, theater and performance, it is not only uh, that uh, I mentioned already that there was international aspect 
uh, of it, uh, uh, mainly for uh, Bitte uh, Festival. But there was also a very strong movement of student uh, theater groups, uh, which uh, was very well connected uh, through the entire uh, uh, country. Uh, and when I say and when I say this, in a way, we could understand Yugoslavia as a, also a country that was European Union before European Union. It was more multi-ethnic uh, uh, country. Uh, which had six constitutive members plus two uh, joint ones. And uh, today, out of those eight, uh, six republics and two regions, so out of those eight entities, seven became independent uh, uh, countries. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and we can read many things that were happening during the Yugoslavia, in close connection with what's going on in uh, uh, in uh, European Union, especially when it comes to uh, different historical and political uh, uh, back, uh, backgrounds. Um, so the, the, uh, the student uh, theater was very important when it comes to experimental uh, theater, as well as indep independent informal uh, groups. And uh, there was a festival of uh, uh, student uh, uh, theaters, which was not only uh, uh, student theater from Yugoslavia, and there was a lot of touring within uh, Yugoslavia when it comes to uh, uh, student uh, theater uh, groups. I'm saying this also because officially there was a support for this within the country. It didn't happen fully spontaneously, most of it did, that, it did, but there were student organizations and uh, they also had very strong um, cultural activities through student cultural centers, through festivals, through exchange uh, and uh, other formats of um, presenting culture. Yeah. So uh, as announced, I will now move to uh, the performance that was originally made in uh, 1969 uh, in Ljubljana, today capital of uh, Slovenia. And <clears throat> it is a performance uh, with very strange title, <laughs> Pupilia Papa Pupila and the Pupilchecks, uh, which according to their offers, uh, doesn't, they don't want to interpret it much, but basically this could mean a family, uh, so, Mother Pupilia, Father Pupilo, and the little Pupilchecks. Uh, but uh, uh, I think the title itself was something that works on a kind of performative uh, level. It is this kind of ludic uh, information uh, or ludic statement uh, that actually puzzles uh, uh, a spectator. Uh, not only when you encounter the title, but also when you see uh, the show itself. So the images that you see on the screen are coming from the uh, original show from 1969. Uh, and uh, particularly, uh, these are images from a TV screening of uh, the show. I am mentioning this because... Uh, this was experimental uh, show, so something unofficial uh, that was made. However, it found its place uh, on a public TV station. And due to that, it was never broadcasted before I did the uh, reenactment. It was not broadcasted uh, before. And also, uh, before I started uh, to do a research on it, there, was, uh, there were two uh, two thirds of the show in the archive uh, that was then that were then restored uh, because the image was a bit uh, distorted, and also uh, the rest of the show or until the the the, the last the crucial scene that I will talk about later uh, was found. Uh, so later, uh, uh, the company where I worked for Masca. Uh, we published the, a DVD uh, with um, both uh, recordings of the original uh, Pupilia and uh, uh, reconstruction. 
Uh, and I will also uh, mention later why is, why is that perform, uh, important to, uh, to mention. <clears throat> uh, so the original show was made by uh, a group of very young people. Uh, they were in the age between 18 to 21. This is very important to mention because basically today it's very difficult to uh, find uh, shows that would be done uh, or enter in a kind of relevant public arena uh, in that age. Yeah? Um, the show was made by a mixed group of different artists. Uh, at the first place, poets, visual artists, musicians, and also amateurs. Uh, so none of them uh, at that point with professional uh, performing skills, being at actors or dancers. So it was an initial idea of this group uh, of at the core were poets, uh, which were looking, they were looking for a different way of presenting literature. This is also uh, important. So they are, end up in theater because they were not satisfied with, uh, let's say, traditional readings or other forms of delivering uh, poetry or, uh, or literature. And uh, here, a uh, happy connection uh, happened between the, the group uh, of very young uh, uh, artists and the director, Dusan Jovanovic, who was a bit older, 10 years older than them, and uh, was already uh, operating as a theater uh, director. Uh, however, uh, he later claimed that uh, with this group of people, uh, it was uh, very difficult or even impossible to work, but the energy and the uh, statements and political awareness that they brought uh, was amazing. And it was uh, something that you could not find in a professional uh, uh, context. Yeah. Um, so the show uh, I'm talking about uh, had, uh, was composed of 20 scenes and um, more or less all of them were about three to four or five minutes long uh, and it was a kind of collage uh, dramaturgy. Now we are talking about 1969. Uh, the performance when you say collage dramaturgy uh, length of the scenes uh, similar to video spots. Uh, 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 juxtaposition of different things from popular culture to ritual, from folk culture to subculture, uh, and so on, from political statements to uh, 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 religious uh, ironizing of religion from uh, uh, relation towards tradition. Uh, towards the relation of uh, <laughs> on the future. So there was juxtaposition of uh, many different things uh, that on the first side, like what this has to do uh, together. And as we know later in the hardcore time of postmodernism, this became some kind of canon. Uh, we, 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 uh, we became open towards uh, uh, non-narrative, uh, non-linear uh, dramaturgy. Uh, we were open to chaos, uh, fragment, fragmentation, and juxtaposition. And in that sense, uh, since we are talking about 1969, in that period of time, you don't find worldwide uh, so many performances that would actually bring that kind of uh, sensitivity, that kind of uh, uh, feeling. Yeah, um, I will check a little bit time. <clears throat> mm. And um, yeah, and that, uh, so the 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 the, the performance uh, had huge impact in the in real time. Uh, and uh, that impact, I think it goes in different direction. Uh, 
to my opinion, it was a, a voice of uh, a generation. And it was a voice of generation that didn't want to wait. Um, and I found it maybe the most, uh, the strongest, uh, even political dimension. Uh, they just did uh, what they wanted and needed uh, to be done. And they shared, they found a way um, how to do that. And also, I think they were lucky because in that constellation in society, that was uh, uh, possible to be done. Uh, so um, uh, the performance was uh, made a huge impact uh, on different uh, levels, as I said, as a voice of generation, uh, but also as a, as a demonstration that theater uh, can be something very different from what uh, uh, we are used to through, let's say, institutional uh, <laughs> practices. Uh, and these uh, differences was not only on a dramaturgical level, as uh, I explained earlier, or on the level of direction, uh, how this was actually composed and put uh, together on the uh, body level, but uh, also in the way of appearance, in the way of acting. And I think here comes also a very uh, crucial uh, connection between theater that decided to be very much embedded and connected in everyday life, uh, comparing to theater who wanted always to be something bigger than everyday life. Uh, Pupilia, Papa, Pupil and the Pupilchecks was just everyday life, just that and, uh, and nothing else. But being just that, it was actually much more <laughs> than just, uh, just uh, everyday life. Uh, and this was the mostly present by uh, the way how they were appearing, appearing uh, uh, on stage. Um, I mentioned already the, uh, the voice of generation that didn't want to wait as a kind of political uh, statement. On another level, uh, we could read uh, political dimension of Pupilia uh, as a kind of statement that goes generally against authorities. Yeah. Being that authority, like political authority, power, communist party, government, uh, and so on, uh, being that religious authorities, being that uh, <clears throat> some other elites in uh, society, uh, but also uh, uh, authorities in the field. They just didn't care whether something uh, will work in the performance or not. Yeah. That's why they had uh, help of, uh, uh, of the director, Jovanovic. But I think also from uh, what I had the chance to learn from them, uh, he also was nourished by this kind of anti-authoritarian uh, uh, dimension. Another aspect that was also uh, interesting uh, for me to address uh, was the question of emerging of dance. Yeah? So I had at some point a, a theory or interpretation of contemporary dance being uh, emerging uh, only in democratic uh, societies. And the, on, on the official level, that holds. Yeah? If you would look uh, what were uh, officially allowed forms of uh, dance uh, in uh, uh, former Communist Party, and here Yugoslavia is not much different from Eastern Bloc, uh, it was uh, ballet and folklore. Contemporary dance was con con considered, or back then called modern dance or uh, <clears throat> expressive dance, um, dance as, was considered as an art form, was considered as something coming from the West and bourgeois, something deviated, something that is not bringing uh, the beauty of body and uh, 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 bringing people together to joy in dance, 
but it's something kind of very uh, uh, distinct and uh, uh, against uh, some kind of general uh, projection in body movement and dance uh, from communist ideology. Uh, however, uh, this, uh, as much as this could maybe be uh, uh, true on the institutional level, uh, on uh, an institutional level, um, this uh, uh, statement certainly uh, cannot hold because um, there was a dance practice in terms as uh, we talk about it uh, today, contemporary dance practice that was emerging uh, in different constellations, not as an autonomous uh, art form, but finding its place in experimental music context uh, at uh, openings of exhibitions uh, in uh, uh, special television and video uh, forms, last but not least in experimental uh, theater uh, performances. And one aspect of uh, dealing with Pupilia was also bringing uh, dance perspective. There was a lot of movement and a lot of choreographic uh, uh, work uh, that one can witness in the show. So how could this performance actually contribute to wider understanding of need of dance to find its place uh, in a kind of uh, artistic uh, uh, scene and artistic uh, uh, context? Uh, now, another point that I would like to bring you see the picture. Uh, so another point that I want to bring is uh, scan scandalizing as censorship slash promotion. Mm. There are different ways how you actually censor uh, something that uh, happened in uh, history. Yeah? One thing is that you try to erase and <clears throat> uh, sooner or later, that kind of enterprise uh, will uh, appear not functioning, not functioning. There will always be something remaining. There would always be a little proof that something actually did take place. Yeah? In case of Pupilia, we had other operation. Uh, uh, the impact that performance had uh, in real time, popularity of that uh, show uh, was something that mainstream could not accept, neither political, neither, uh, neither cultural. Yeah? So what happened uh, and mainly, and this was mainly for cultural establishment, Pupilia was not ignored, far from, far from that. There is extensive documentation. As I said, there is a recording on public TV there is uh, there are a lot there were a lot of writings and somehow it echoed the performance echoes through uh, even until today uh, but if you would go and read uh, the writings about it uh, before the reconstruction that we did in 2006 mostly it uh, focused on a scandal. And the scandal, the scandal of uh, the show was slaughtering of a chicken at the end of uh, uh, performance. Yeah? Now, a scandalizing uh, as a censorship here means that all the other aspects, all the other uh, qualities, all the other dimensions and dynamics of performance were actually eliminated by... Uh, uh, focusing uh, on uh, most controversial scene of, uh, of the performance. Uh, and in that sense, basically, when you say, like, how do you produce censorship? You produce it uh, in such a way that when you say Pupilia, aha, that's the show where they slaughtered the chicken, full stop, the end of the story. So, uh, of course, in different uh, uh, in different uh, historical uh, context and yeah, in different contexts of discussion, uh, 
there might be a next question uh, about the performance and about the scene and so on. But generally speaking, the label of the show was so strong, on the show was so strong, uh, that it needed nearly 30 or more, more than 30 years, yeah, more than 30 years uh, to um, somehow affirm other uh, aspects, not only of that show, but of the period of what exactly you are doing through your, uh, through your series uh, of talks. Uh, so, uh, and yet, yet, yeah, there is, uh, there is something uh, 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 that scandalizing does. Uh, it is not only that censors, but somehow it keeps uh, uh, a voice on a certain, uh, in this case, performance uh, loud. And I don't want to speculate too far. I know this is, uh, needs further uh, elaboration. But um, yeah, before, uh, before I uh, talk briefly uh, about uh, the reconstruction of it, uh, I would just like to uh, uh, talk briefly about Western reception of Pupilia. Yeah. Now, it's important to say that in that period of time, uh, and there, were, there was not there was no touring system or festival system as we know it today. Uh, I mentioned uh, Bita Festival, Festival of New Tendencies in Theatre, uh, which took place in Belgrade every September. Uh, but exchange uh, between the countries was not, was uncomparable to what we have today. Uh, and saying that, uh, to understand that Pupilia was not performed outside of the borders of uh, uh, Yugoslavia. They were performing for one year, the show. Uh, and uh, after that show, so before that show, the group that was called Pupilia Ferkewerk, they did already uh, one, one show. And after that, they, do, they did two more shows but they kind of they were not they didn't have some kind of significant uh impact uh, <clears throat> however uh, just to uh to tell you what happened to us when we performed for the first time in uh, reconstruction uh, we performed in different countries and the first one was vienna and uh after the show I got a question. There was after talk, like talk with the, with the audience, and somebody asked if that show uh, uh, did take place at all. And before uh, I go on with this question, <laughs> I will show you a couple of uh, uh, images and uh, explain a little bit uh, why did we did uh, this. Uh, reconstruction. So, as you can already uh, uh, figure out from what I already said, uh, <clears throat> one of the reasons certainly was to bring forward Pupilia with uh, statements that uh, remained hidden by this kind of reduction on uh, the question of uh, uh, scandal, of slaughtering uh, chicken. It was not only that, uh, there were also other aspects that were like shocking and uh, new and uh, not seen uh, uh, before. Uh, however, uh, this uh, uh, dimension of the theater form, theater format, way of acting, dramaturgy, uh, politicality uh, of the show, this all contributed to decision to, uh, to make reconstruction. And the context of reconstruction was also uh, important because it is related to uh, the journal uh, that I uh, edited back then, and it's also called Matska as the company. And it was number 100 uh, that was published in 2006. And uh, we somehow wanted to uh, look back 
And since uh, Maska is not only publishing, but also a production house, uh, the decision at the end was, okay, let's bring something from the past uh, in, in uh, real time. Uh, and, uh, uh, and there were other aspects that was also looking in the future, but this we can talk uh, another, uh, another time. Um, so uh, let me briefly show some of the, uh, some of the uh, parts of the show. Yeah? Okay, for example, um, one of the principles was rotation of the cast. Uh, in the original show, there were 15 uh, performers as I mentioned, but they were basically changing, uh, basically from one show uh, to the other, uh, because uh, uh, as I mentioned, they were very young, 18 to 21, and the influence of uh, uh, their surrounding, surrounding, especially family, parents, and so on, was so strong that actually after uh, 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 their parents would uh, hear that they performed in the show, they would be forbidden actually to go. That's why uh, in one year uh, that they performed Pupilia, and I don't know how many exactly performances they did, there were 31 uh, performers that actually took place in, uh, in that show. So you can say that it became some kind of small movement uh, actually, uh, to be part of uh, uh, Pupilia. Yeah? <clears throat> uh, that's why, okay, uh, in 2006, in professional uh, context, very precarious, not institutional, but uh, NGO, uh, the question is, what can you actually afford? Uh, to afford a show with 15 performers on stage is a dream. It, was, uh, it would be impossible. So uh, we somehow uh, made a show with 11 uh, performers and uh, we decided to rotate the cast on a daily basis. So we would meet on the day of performance and decide about the cast uh, on that day, which means that every performer knew the entire show and they were ready uh, to jump in into, uh, <clears throat> into it. Uh, by saying this, uh, I immediately want to say that the reconstruction of Pupilia was not like pure reenactment, pure in terms of like copying exactly something from the past and bringing it in another time untouched. Yeah? And uh, the main difference was the fact that we wanted to show people, look, you are looking at some, you are watching something that is happening here and now with the strong reference, unbearably strong reference to something that did take place in 1969, but it's happening here uh, and now. So in the very act of how the things were brought uh, to the audience in a reconstructed performance, uh, there was a um, uh, dimension of showing uh, what relates to uh, the original performance. Yeah? Maybe another, uh, since we are speaking in English, uh, I don't know what is the uh, Portuguese word for reconstruction and what is for reenactment, uh, but um, interestingly enough, yeah, if you look uh, today, uh, the, the, the name, there is a kind of standard name for uh, uh, doing again the performance from the past is reenactment. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> if you uh, read uh, texts that were written in the 80s about uh, reenactments of the show from historical avant-garde, 1920s, uh, you would see that actually uh, the name that they used was reconstruction. So what happened in these 20 years uh, that uh, uh, the, the same practice was uh, uh, renamed, uh, it's to be uh, seen and analyzed and so on. However, I subtitled this show reconstruction and not reenactment uh, for two reasons. One is 
that every kind of historization is constructing. You basically construct a story, you basically construct uh, something that uh, wants to shape the gaze of today uh, towards the past. The other reason is that whenever you deal with uh, the past, you also try somehow to reconstruct in this very basic, uh, 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 very basic things, even forensic uh, things, where you want to put broken pieces of an event together and somehow make sense uh, out of it as reconstructing the ways from, let's say, ancient uh, ancient period. <clears throat> uh, so. Uh, mm, one of the uh, one of the principles that uh, we found uh, in Pupilia, although they never uh, explicitly talk about uh, performing chance, was chance. Yeah. So we made two scenes in a such a way through elimination uh, uh, game that actually it was never clear. If on uh, uh, in in that performance, who will actually be the one doing the next scene? We decided uh, most of it before the show, but not everything. So it uh, it remained also uh, to the show itself to actually make casting in real time here and uh, here and now. One of the reasons was also uh, to um, somehow keep. Uh, the freshness of uh, the original uh, performance uh, that was so praised. Yeah. Um, um, the, the other thing uh, which was uh, for us important was somehow to make a bridge between what is happening now on stage and what you see in the back on the screen. Yeah? So we made uh, a screening and we were thinking like uh, with two collaborators, Samo Gosfrej and Igor Stromayer, like how would MTV look like if it would exist in 1969, yeah? with split screen, with running bar, and all the features which were, uh, for example, standard in 2006. Uh, so we made this kind of split screen uh, uh, combination of text and images, and uh, in uh, in a lower left screen, small screen, you could see original recording. So you could basically all the time check whether what is going on uh, live on stage uh, is uh, uh, relating or is it the same or uh, how does actually uh, 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 function. And what was interesting for me, it was not about one show is here and the other show is there, but it's actually the you, a spectator, who are actually negotiating with yourself by zooming either on old show or on uh, uh, new show, or basically zooming out, thinking about other things uh, in that moment. Uh, that was uh, what was actually important for us. So how do you actually relate to something that is uh, offered to you and it's not, it is quite explicit. We did new show based on the, on the, la, on the last one, uh, on the old one, but uh, we also uh, wanted to bring forward the old one in, it, in its oldness, in its documentality, as a document. And here, the question that I received in Vienna became even a bigger surprise, yeah? So, uh, the images that you see in the video, they are coming from uh, the original show. And uh, obviously, that was not convincing enough uh, to be treated as a historical uh, document. And maybe we come later to the interpretation why. Yeah. Uh, so these were different uh, ways of uh, copying not only copying scenes, but also showing. Yeah? Uh, and uh, some of solutions, for example, this is a solution for uh, a missing part. So there, is a mi there was a missing part of recordings, as I mentioned uh, earlier, 
and basically we film it in the aesthetics of the original show. And then in front of, uh, of the screen, uh, it was a kind of a mime version of, uh, of the same scene without props and so on. So it was kind of solution uh, how to actually bring something that is missing. Yeah? And uh, here, this missing kind of moment was literally uh, shown. There are missing objects, there is something missing from the scene, but the scene itself from the original is missing. Yeah? Uh, and then there was copying like what was going on in front of the stage uh, on the back, then a symmetry like mirroring, copying what is happening on one side of the stage to the other. Here it's interesting, <clears throat> one of the scenes was called L, uh, which is the title of the uh, women magazine, French women magazine, which had its own Slovenian edition uh, in, uh, in late uh, uh, 60s. Uh, and in 1969, they did the scene called computer. Uh, and uh, they made some kind of fluxus uh, uh, concert uh, where they imitate kind of sounds of uh, computer. Uh, amazing, knowing that we are in 1969. So you see a little bit uh, this uh, uh, passing through, you know, L magazine, something that is very constitutive for uh, and emancipating uh, uh, back then for in popular culture and computer, we are talking about period before, much, much, much before uh, uh, personal computers. But of course, there is a fantasy uh, about them, very present. Uh, this is a, a scene that is, uh, let, let's say, my interpretation so maybe i skip it now because we are already running out of uh, time uh, <clears throat> but there was a reference to contact improvisation how to understand contact improvisation uh, in uh, in communist uh, uh, context yeah There was a lot of uh, playing with language also. Uh, so they composed a kind of uh, song based on uh, <clears throat> pig Latin. So kind of invented uh, language. And this was also interesting uh, uh, scene. So there was a scene called concert uh, in the original Pupilia where uh, they also had the conductor. And uh, in our case, we invited every night a different conductor that was not part of the uh, show. And it was sometimes funny because uh, none of the people that we invited, and we usually invited some public uh, uh, persons, directors, uh, festival directors, uh, <clears throat> artists, and so on, uh, they, di they didn't have any knowledge on condu conducting. But here, uh, uh, there is a beautiful uh, story in Adorno's introduction to music uh, in, in his book, where he is actually uh, bringing this question, can the orchestra function without, uh, uh, without a conductor? Yeah. Then we re recorded this, uh, the voice of... Uh, uh, the director of the original show, who was uh, telling the, who was describing the scene. So there is a script uh, of the show, of the original show, that has been uh, uh, saved, and it was very valuable um, source for uh, doing reenactment. Uh, so here you can, in this scene, you can listen to the voice of uh, the original director. Uh, being present uh, in <clears throat> uh, in the show, uh, we also filmed. Uh, I don't have a picture here. I guess. Let me check. Maybe I skipped it. Uh, aha! Uh, so the cast in the reconstruction 
there was one performer from the original cast, and that's a musician that is playing clarinet. You can see him uh, in the back. Uh, <clears throat> however, we organized gathering of nearly entire team of the original uh, cast, uh, and we filmed them while they were watching, probably for the first time in their life, uh, a recording of the show in which they performed. So some, I think it was 37 years, yes, 37 years after they, uh, they did it themselves. So they were looking at it. And we filmed them and we used those shots during, uh, 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 during the reconstruction, basically showing them watching themselves. But this time they would watch... Uh, uh, new staging of uh, Pupilia. <clears throat> and, uh, and then came this last scene, which uh, uh, created uh, another kind of problem, uh, as it did in, uh, uh, in uh, 1969. Uh, so back then, the show was not forbidden, uh, although they uh, uh, <clears throat> slaughtered. Uh, chicken at the end of the uh, at the end of the show. The regulation back then did not constrain uh, artistic freedom in that in uh, in in that manner. Yeah, in that uh, in that part. When we uh, were preparing the show, we were faced with uh, with this question, and it was clearly <coughs> stated to us. You cannot perform in our theater if you uh, slaughter a uh, chicken. Yeah? So, of course, the uh, first question was, how can you censor? How can you censor? Why don't you talk with us? You know, we, maybe we find kind of, you know, frame and so on and so forth. But um, being in this kind of uh, 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 thoughts, I was actually uh, thinking more and more uh, what was the reason that they, in the original show, slaughtered the chicken. And uh, their interpretation uh, is that they wanted actually to make something real. Like theater has to be real, has to punch you in the face or in the stomach. Uh, it has to be something that matters. And this realness is possible to produce only with uh, something uh, of a kind. So taking life of a chicken. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to uh, me and also other members of artistic team, uh, after being uh, censored, after being clearly uh, <clears throat> said, either you change or you don't enter, uh, we were actually uh, facing another reality, and that's the reality of uh, uh, censorship. And we decided to stage that, not to stage slaughtering of chicken, but staging uh, uh, censorship. Yeah? And uh, the, the, the scene was announced as we were censored to do the last uh, scene as uh, it has been done <clears throat> in the original show. So we offer you four options and you, the audience, vote for it. One, uh, uh, option option A was uh, reconstructed the recording of the scene, so film about slaughtering chicken. Uh, B option was first-hand accounts of the scene uh, by two performers from the original show that did slaughter a chicken. The option C was uh, a quote from the regulations for the protection of animals for slaughter, which is quite interesting reading because you see uh, actually how to <clears throat> treat an animal before you slaughter it. And the last option was the enactment of the slaughter scene. So if you decide, we will do it. Yeah. And okay, this is uh, from one of the first nights. You could see that pre prevailing kind of uh, attitude uh, was option D like live slaughtering yeah? uh, on, on stage. Yeah? And uh, one should be careful in interpreting this because uh, uh, 
like the first reaction could easily be okay nothing just nothing has happened from roman time uh at the end of the day what people want to see is blood yeah and i possible possible but i would also add something else uh, the original performance as well as reconstruction is relatively light in its spirit it's kind of nice time there is singing there is dancing there is humor there are statements uh, there are a lot of people on the stage which like it's not really a spectacle but it's very vivid very dynamic uh, and there is also some kind of constant subverting of what was already uh, happening uh, there you go in the next scene and the next scene is uh, surprise and it's uh, putting previous scenes in another reading and so on so basically people thought okay it's another surprise but uh, of, they don't think seriously it's all together some kind of uh, uh, irony yeah so how did this continue yeah uh, <clears throat> Um, <coughs> actors uh, counted voting and report yeah and in most of the cases it was option d which means uh, enactment of slaughtering that was chosen and uh, uh, after that declaration the audience was uh, smiling there is a beautiful 10 minutes video about this uh, ending uh which shows how dramatically uh uh spirit in the audience changed so there is kind of uh uh, uh laughing rela relation and then suddenly uh, uh the atmosphere uh, turns into uh, total silence especially when uh, uh they see that uh, actors are preparing everything for slaughtering yeah? Uh, but after a couple of minutes of this preparation and this kind of very tense and cold atmosphere in the audience, one actor comes in front of the audience and said, okay, now one of you who voted for uh, slaughtering, come on stage and do it. Like, if you voted for that, uh, I mean, come and do it. We, we don't want to do that. Come and do it. And the first reaction was again, you know laughing and it's also a relief okay they don't they're not going to do it uh it's a kind of uh, relief yeah uh, but this relief again uh changed because nothing is happening and nothing is happening and chicken is in front of people uh, and anyway to make a story uh uh, uh short uh there were three shows in which people did appear on stage after being invited uh, to do it themselves do the slaughtering themselves in belgrade in chividal in italy and in berlin in fort spin <clears throat> and uh in none of the cases uh, don't uh, don't <laughs> be, be panic in none of the cases chicken was slaughtered yeah for various uh, uh, reasons but um, what I uh, uh, what was interesting uh, in this situation, and I go back a little bit, was how uh, responsible can a micro community be for a decision that they made? And this is a, a, a old and eternal debate within legitimate and uh, legal. Legally speaking, you cannot do. Uh, you cannot slaughter a chicken in the theater only under very 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 special conditions that it's basically impossible to uh, create and the other thing is uh, <clears throat> uh yeah the other okay i don't know something uh, slipped from uh, uh ah yeah okay the other thing is legitimate can as, uh, can a, a certain group of people decide something that is not legal and actually step in the action and i think we are facing this in uh, real life on a daily uh, on a daily basis uh, <clears throat> and i wanted somehow to bring uh, uh, this tension 
And another thing is I told you about one ending yeah? because uh, historical awareness of the fact that when you make, when you write history or perform history, when you publish history, uh, you don't do it only for present, but you also do it for the future because uh, there will be, uh, there will be sooner or later, there will be for some time the field of interest will be for some time charged with your interpretation. And in that sense, you never do history only for now, and especially you don't do it for the past, but you do it for present and also for future. And then I was thinking, okay, what if in 30 years, 35 years, uh, somebody would actually uh, approach the reenactment and look at the show? And I was thinking, okay, uh, let's make two different endings uh, and let's hope there will be uh, records of both of them. Yeah. So we made the other evening without voting that went on in a different way. And in, uh, in this attempt to enter, to offer a history, uh, a possibility of two completely different informations about how this show ended, we succeeded because two main critics uh, uh, back then who came to see the show, they came on two different nights when uh, the endings were different. So now, if you go back and you want to read about uh, uh, that uh, performance and how did it end and so on, and if you want to rely on the interpretation of theater critics, who are, by the way, very reliable, you will have two completely different uh, uh, insights and uh, interpretation. Uh, last but not least, for the end of this uh, uh, talk, uh, I would like uh, just to mention another uh, fact that um, somehow life of Pupilia Papo Pupilo and the Pupilchecks continues. Uh, it even became a part of curriculum for uh, high schools. And uh, last year, uh, the uh, uh, artist art school uh, in Ljubljana did the reenactment of the show, which was uh, much closer in the, in, in the visual and performing uh, aspect, actually much closer to the original as uh, our show, show uh, was. Uh, so thank you very much. And I went a little bit uh, over time, uh, but yeah, somehow we, uh, <clears throat> I had the feeling that uh, uh, I could. It's okay. Uh, thank you so much, Janesh. Um, well, I have a lot of, I've taken a lot of notes and and might pose you a lot of questions. I, I would um, like to inform everybody that um, that we are open to questions. Portanto, se tiverem questões, podem escrevê-las aqui no chat ou, no, ou no, no, nos canais do, do Facebook e do YouTube, e nós vamos recolhendo questões. Um, vou começar por colocar eu algumas, então. So, uh, well, I have several questions, as I told you, but maybe I will start by, by, by complicating again with, with, um, with time. So... Um, I might say that I also read a, a beautiful and really complex paper you wrote, uh, basically telling the same, but in in a with a different structure, so to say. So when one of the questions I had when I was reading that and that I had also now was the very presence of the the moment in two thousand and six when you when you did this uh, reconstruction. So I think I would like to ask you. Um, what does this uh, reconstruction tells us about the very moment uh, of 2006 when it, it was made? And I'm thinking both in um, thinking of what was uh, the, the theater and performance scene back then. Uh, uh, it's a little bit before this, va this uh, wave of reenactments that we had, uh, especially in dance, but it's kind of a bit before, I would say. Um, 
And so, yeah, I think this is it. What does it tell us about, also what does it tell us about the political moment that we were living back then and our relation to, to that moment? Um, so what does it tell us about 2006 and what of that moment is different from the one where, where we are now? I don't know if this, uh, this question is clear. And then I will add a third one, which, which is, how come or in which ways do you think this, your own gesture of restaging, uh, um, restaging no, <laughs> reconstruction, uh, this performance as you did contributed to, to where we are now uh, in comparison to where we were in 2006? I'm not, I'm not sure if it's clear, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, I can, <clears throat> uh, I can maybe try to answer about uh, other motives uh, in... Uh, uh, in decision why to do why to do it maybe something very special and micro uh, back then i was very much uh, following uh, um, let's say new term choreographic term that started in the 90s uh, in uh, <clears throat> in uh, uh, in contemporary dance and uh, oh, uh, uh, Janis, one more question. Maybe I would also ask you to go to EDA from there. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. Uh, it's yeah. a good connection. Uh, so um, to make it uh, to make it a little bit uh, simple, uh, uh, what uh, what what the new wave, this new choreographic turn that happened in the nineties brought is uh, some kind of. Uh, um, uh, approach to dance, which would be my, much close to everyday life, which would be much close to the bodies that are there and not uh, uh, trained uh, bodies uh, which are uh, operating in a certain kind of technique, uh, realm. And by this, of course, bringing the question, what is actually that is projected in the bodies, but what is, what is also uh, somehow embedded and installed in bodies. What do we have uh, in our bodies that uh, actually is something that is uh, the product of both, something that we got through education, but also something that we project uh, or others project uh, on us. And that's where, where I see uh, uh, political dimension of uh, everydayness. It is not so much about... Uh, bring, bringing everydayness and the look of everydayness on stage, but it's much more political in terms of uh, looking at how the body is uh, constructed. And uh, aesthetic approach that was prevailing before in dance uh, somehow could not uh, give satisfying answer to this. Uh, and this is the context where uh, Pupilia became interesting for me. One of the contexts, the context, let's say, of current, uh, uh, current events in uh, mainly in contemporary dance or experimental uh, movement per uh, performance. The other thing was level, completely on the same level of relevance, but in a different context. What is that uh, is somehow, what, what are the criteria that something becomes part of historical canon and something does not become? I talked briefly a little bit uh, uh, through the concept of scandalization. And uh, <clears throat> I think uh, there is some kind of uh, humanistic uh, traditional spectrum of values there is constantly uh, challenged but not more than that you know? uh, so at the end of the day when it comes to art good art uh, is the one that is well done somehow in a kind of traditional metier sense and so on uh, and uh, with all the perspectives that happen with uh, the art from 60s on where this uh, became, uh, where the notion of art changed a lot, already with Dishon and with uh, his ready-made, but uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the question that made me interest, being interested in Pupilia was 
uh, why uh, is this going to become a canon of a certain uh, national uh, <clears throat> a paradigm uh, of theater or not? Did it become or? Uh, I think it is slowly becoming. It's like, you know, I think it is the, the, the moment that the decision of the uh, teaching staff in high school to make this as a, as a part of the curriculum and also uh, restaging it as a final work, uh, I found it really extraordinary uh, because, you know, they do all kinds of uh, things from traditional to... Uh, when I'm talking not about that particular school, but generally speaking, uh, uh, you have um, some things that are from this universal humanist perspective praised as good, uh, uh, good art. And Pupilia certainly uh, is not. It was an amateur uh, performance. So it's not a big piece of art in those terms, but it's, uh, the, uh, it's an artwork which goes much more beyond, opens much a more relevant uh, question uh, in a convincing uh, uh, way. Uh, so I think uh, this, I gave it two, uh, uh, two perspectives and uh, maybe the third and not so important uh, was actually uh, doing uh, research and then thinking actually how this research uh, becomes somehow part uh, of the show. Of course, we also had a lot of scandalizing because of the last uh, uh, scene. Uh, but uh, if you are curious, we can we can uh, talk also about this. But it is some something that uh, <clears throat> uh, was somehow uh, not so important, and we also manage. Uh, pretty much to uh, give focus on uh, entire movement, entire uh, <clears throat> uh, work of the group and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, <clears throat> so, so in this point, the, the scandal that this reconstructed performance had didn't, uh, I don't know how you say it, up, up, up fly, obfuscate the, the entire show as it did, as it happened with, um, with the initial one, right? Um, okay. I think I do have... Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go on, go on. I, know, uh, I think, I mean, if you relate this, this kind of, the performance to the very moment where, when it happens, and if you look at, I mean, 69, 68, and all this, um, well, which in all this period in, in student uh -huh. movements, yeah. that actually, if you think of uh, just like in Italy, just right there, it's, it goes until 77. And if you think of the, the, um, the global circulation of students that actually exists, also in Portugal, you, we can find performances um, from the 60s, which actually travel and which are, I mean, it, they are in the same circuit and they somehow uh, belong to the same. I'm thinking, for example, of a very famous uh, performance of Sitak in, in 69, I do believe, related to the crisis of, of 69. So, so actually, what I do think about the way this period um, or certain cultural objects of this period are treated as scandals, um, I think it's, it has to do with the objects themselves, but it also has to do with the, with the approach on this period of time. You, you sure. Mm. So, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here I completely agree because uh, the language that for interpretation that they had is different than what we have today. Also, the power structures were much different uh, than, uh, than it is today. Uh, in I mean, it's very, I don't want now to compare 69 and 2006 because the differences are uh, enormous. Uh, no more Cold War, no more non-allied non countries. Uh, uh, Europe is the, the democracy, democrat no more fascism in Portugal and, uh, and in uh, Greece. 
let's not forget that uh, uh, we have it. Uh, we have fascism also after the Second World War. So uh, the world completely changed, and in that sense, uh, that's maybe why uh, I why we did that approach as we did it. So to actually show that we are doing something now, here and now, that, I, I, yes. that relates. There is... I, don't believe that's a, uh, the, I, I agree with you. I'm sorry. I don't believe... I think there is, a, in a way, some... some uh, in somehow that period is often seen as an excess. I mean, that will happen also with the post-revolution project. It's this excess, so people were immature. People... So we can treat all of this as... Um, a sort of an emotional discharge or something. And so we cannot actually really rationalize it or understand it. And in, in that sense, I think um, stating... But that's not my point. That's mm -hmm. not my point. I mean, the difference, the difference is in, I don't know, global political constellation, but also in local uh, politics. The, in, in case of Pupilia, uh, basically the, the reconstruction was made in another country, in the same city. Mm -hmm. But in another country, so the, the, these changes are dramatic, uh, dramatic in terms of political regime, for example. What is the quality of political regime on the level of life of people in everyday life is another question. So here uh, we can then start to, uh, to make uh, uh, some comparisons or some uh, analysis. Mm. No, but, but so now you're talking about the how how the performance was uh, the reception of the performance in Austria, right? Yeah, that was a question that completely surprised me because uh, we were trying to show as much as possible documentation, so you could read and see the pictures and even the video from the original show, and yet it was creating uh, this kind of doubt. And when I was thinking later, okay, what is that uh, uh, made someone to think about that this could not exist? I think it's a kind of global uh, uh, or kind of general uh, view from the West that uh, uh, saw and still can see in the East, uh, in Eastern Bloc and here due to ignorance not making difference between Yugoslavia and the rest of uh, uh, um, uh, socialist and communist countries, uh, they were thinking, you know, life, I think, life in socialism was poor, was miserable. There is no way uh, that something so vivid, something uh, so also emancipated, something so playful could actually represent or stand or be or be generated uh, or happen that something like that could happen in uh, that kind of uh, society yeah uh, so i i think there is some kind of you know behind the iron curtain mm -hmm. <laughs> everything is uh, black and white you know <laughs> so i, I, agree, I uh, think that this yeah and uh, but look there is a consequence of this it is not that this kind of gaze uh, is um, equal to truth, mm -hmm. but this kind of gaze is equal to interests that we have in art coming from that zone. So show me something poor, something sh show me something suffering, show me something gray. That's what we expect from uh, uh, that part uh, of the world, mm -hmm. not something playful, colorful, uh, 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 crazy, uh, ludic, uh, advanced in dramaturgy and uh, and uh, acting, uh, non-conformist in uh, uh, in the way. I, I, I would say I would uh, dare to say that my that Portugal could be an exception. Uh, uh, I mean, I um, I grew up in the eighties here, and I maybe because Portugal has this this uh, very late revolution and this really long dictatorship, um, so that in somehow I think there was all a certain group of the society here had a um, 
was I was really interested in Yugoslavia and knew that it was different. And so I wouldn't. I think from here and from this perspective, we wouldn't say so. Uh, I, I at least <laughs> I think. But I I, um, I think there's another thing relating to that period, which is the fact that some some objects look inconceivable. So it's we cannot even think of those kind of things um as looked from the point of view of today that's part of my interest in revisiting this this very concrete experiences and often these concrete experiences are related to to the dissemination and major changes in in everyday life also due to consumerism and to uh, the massification of pop culture so in cosmopolitanism and the fact that most people are or um a big part of people are from the 60s on starts living in the cities, et cetera, et cetera. So, so in somehow uh, I would relate um, a certain kind of practices, performative practices, um, which often um, will, will use for themselves everyday life um, gestures, uh, tasks and stuff like that with the with the rise or with a certain rise of a uh, of um uh, middle class and uh, urban middle class i don't know if you agree with this but at least here we could start uh, we can talk uh, or we can say that from from where i i stand i would say that i don't know if you make if you have that um that very uh, impression uh, Hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can go even further uh, from uh, there. What happened? The question, like, what happened with the generation of uh, uh, Pupilia and the generation um, in Western world uh, uh, who happened to be part of the student revolution uh, in late sixties? So the, the the famous slogan of that uh, revolution at a certain point became long march through the institutions. And uh, when it comes to the makers of Pupilia, uh, historically speaking, that certainly uh, became motto also for uh, quite some of them who became important uh, uh, players in uh, general cultural uh, life of the country back then and also the new country, uh, <clears throat> uh, focusing themselves, focusing their work in the institutions. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that's another, I think that's another question, which is uh, where are the, these people now? What are they doing? And how did they relate to, to the fact that you were you were doing this but in somehow i i i do i do see uh, and you can also at least look at it in some of some um, works in experimental poetry for instance uh, that they, they in somehow they they address modernization as an event so in somehow they start talking about everyday life about gestures objects uh, stuff uh, tasks and in that sense um I think that poses, um, I mean, that's really different from what theater up until then was doing. And it's, it gets more closer to some uh, of the postmodern dance uh, practices being theorized and et cetera in the US, if you could say it, I would say. Oh. But still, now the question, where are these people now and how did they, uh, how did they relate to, to, to your reconstruction? Yeah, unfortunately, quite some of them uh, died after <clears throat> uh, in this period. So I did the reconstruction in 2006. And we performed the piece uh, for four years. Uh, and uh, in one of the shows, uh, I, they performed those who were available and uh, wanted to be on stage again. Uh, they appeared in one of the shows. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the the entire uh, journey for uh, working on uh, researching and working on the reconstruction and so on was uh, <clears throat> uh, very beautiful, also on a human level, uh, because uh, they were so generous and open uh, towards their past. Uh, 
and also relaxed because that was really something that they didn't really stay attached so much. They had their own careers that went in a completely different directions. Uh, and um, they also uh, were very skeptical, like it, it's impossible, you, you know, you do what we did uh, and it's impossible that it will work and so on. And they were right. Uh, what, what is really impossible, it's not to copy uh, the show. You can. Somehow you find enough of uh, uh, visual materials, uh, testimonies, uh, writing material and so on that you can actually arrive pretty close uh, to original. But what you cannot uh, reconstruct is audience. Even if you would have in the audience exactly the same people, like imagine this, to have exactly the same people who were on the premiere, for example, in 1969, those people would, wouldn't be the same. You know? So basically, it's mission impossible to recreate the same. That's why I call it reconstruction, because sooner or later, you end up in the fact that this is happening now, and why do you do this now? Like, why to you know, uh, bring this? And to add a little bit to what I talked uh, before, the question is also, where do you see yourself when it comes uh, to, I don't know, when you produce something and you work in a certain context, what is the context that somehow you want to be referred to? Like, where do you, where do you somehow place yourself? In which line uh, of uh, uh, tradition? That is question for not personal question but how you actually compose uh, different historical uh, yeah. narratives mm -hmm. i understand could you say that since somehow for you and people from Masca, this would help to place you in a some something kind of genealogy i mean even to place you among disciplines i understood what you were telling me, I, I, I quite related to what the context in dance uh, you were talking about to, I'm not sure if this is like this, but one of the previous dance movements was Portuguese New Dance Movement. So when I spent, I don't know how many years after, but suddenly you have a Eastern dance, Nova Dance, uh, last, I don't know how you say it in, uh, but I remember actually watching it or, um, um, I remember watching it um, as framed as from European programs and stuff like this, actually. Uh, yeah. The, so the, and somehow, would you say that while you are trying to, when you reconstructed this performance, you were also trying to find um, a place for yourselves within this, this, um, the, this, this panorama of the the performing arts scene that for one in one hand you i think hans tis lemon was about to launch uh, uh, post dramatic theater no i think it's i don't know when is it from but it's from more or less that period of time no? was a, it was a bit earlier yeah. yeah it was a couple of years uh, before that no i wouldn't i wouldn't say that like like this is my homeland you know uh, and when it comes uh, how do i think and what do i rather different in my formative years, uh, uh, Pupilia was something that I really didn't want to, like, what is this, some kind of amateur show, what were they busy? It was not, I didn't have this uh, uh, interest uh, in my formative years, student years and uh, so on. Uh, I, I don't think this is much of a personal uh, question. I think it's more... Uh, about what I said earlier, uh, like what is that uh, that is uh, inscribed in history mm -hmm. and what are the criteria? you know, uh, because you can say in Portugal, uh, you know, this is the best performance uh, uh, ever. This is so important. This is huge and so on. But Portugal being... Uh, uh, distant from uh, the, the, the hardcore European center and the, 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 let's say, creators of trends and also uh, uh, far from 
where the money for culture is hard, uh, it's di uh, it's distributed uh, in a kind of substantial uh, uh, way. I think your voice is heard maybe a little bit uh, behind Portuguese borders, but not much further. Mm -hmm. So there are the voices of different people are heard with different uh, different range. And in that sense, uh, for me, uh, being busy with it uh, was also being busy like, okay, and the, uh, uh, what is that we, you know, what we, is that we will talk about? What is relevant? Like, what is the history that we want to see from, uh, from this perspective? And that's why I mentioned also uh, a little bit uh, this surprising question from Vienna, which for me became and still is very indicative. Like, sorry, but <laughs> yeah, from this and, part and of the world, we don't expect this. You know, I, I understand we don't expect this. The, so <laughs> give us something else because yes. that's not. I understand it. So, I mean, the, the idea would be like Grotowski and this kind of I said, I am austerity and uh, truth and whatever. Um, yes, I, I, I didn't meant as a personal question. I was meant more as a looking at Masca as the editorial project and to this entire work that you were doing actually in the European scene and, and pretty much on the, Euro the European scene, which was also at that moment pretty strong also in dance. And um, when I look at dance from the, the 1980s, I always quote this book from uh, this French book, like La Naissance du Mouvement Pensé, uh, you know, like that contemporary dance is the movement of uh, is the birth of a movement of thought, I think. So this, so the, the contemporary dance scene as a place to, to stage contemporary as a problem, something like this. And in that sense, I understand why uh, would this performance be interested to, to that sort of genealogy or whatever. Um, but so to say, uh, you already, um, you've spoken frequently about amateur and professional. I don't know how those categories work uh, and worked at the time. I mean, here they are pretty um, uh, recent, I would say. I mean, uh, part of the independent theater scene of the 70s came from the university theater and, so, and movements, mm -hmm. well, not so radical as the one you described, but pretty radical for their time. And, and actually, um, so you can, we can all only really talk about a, professional theater scene, which is not commercial uh, quite late here. So I don't know how those those categories work, uh, um, but why would the amateur be uh, a problem or uh, or why, or how, how did that function actually for me to understand a bit better? Yeah, it was actually, it wasn't really a problem, uh, <clears throat> but it was like, generally speaking, but it was a problem for cultural establishment uh, because uh, they faced something that works, that worked. They faced something that had huge impact. So what to do now with it? Like you cannot, you can of course say this is kind of rubbish or this is, which they said, the language with which they, the critics approached original populace is uh, um, yeah hilarious what kind of uh, language they invented uh, to and I'm talking about uh, like mainstream uh, uh, critics what kind of language they invented somehow to discredit uh, the performance uh, I take amateur acting as a kind of uh, quality. It can also be called non-acting, uh, but I think in this case there are things are not so easy to somehow uh, uh, distinguish. Uh, but amateur is the one that doesn't have a knowledge, but it has uh, affinity, passion, statement, and so on, and goes into certain field because of that. He, it, it doesn't have skills but it has all the rest. And in that sense, uh, skills can appear 
to be uh, produced in a kind of non-academic terms. So you don't arrive to a certain skill, for example, collage dramaturgy and everyday performing and so on. You don't arrive there uh, through academic uh, training, but through uh, certain practice and uh, your life attitude that you bring in art. Uh, and you create something that um, is relevant and works. I understand. I don't know. Maybe let's do. Well, we don't have questions up until now. Let's do more one or two questions. I don't know. Or, uh, or if you want, there is something very specific that you want to tell us. Just also think about it. I'm I'm curious about the audience that you were saying that we cannot reconstruct the audience, and because this is also pretty much related to the the context and and to this period is a milieu and so I don't know if can you talk a bit more about the audience back then and when you did it and, and all of this um, <clears throat> there were people also uh, who saw the original uh, show and they came uh, to see the reconstruction and you know it's 37 years it's a long period in life of a person uh, so mainly they had some uh, memory on it but that memory is more memory on affect like it was crazy or it was like i could barely enter the room and was people were shouting uh, and so on so it's something affectual that was very much on the body level you yeah? But I also have to tell you, uh, because I interviewed most of uh, the performers, uh, they had very uh, uh, short memory on what was happening, how did they work, and so on. Because the, they were hippies, mm -hmm. or let's say not really hippies as we know them from uh, pictures, but certain lifestyle. Uh, where they would gather and spend time together and drink and smoke and so on. So <clears throat> it was the performance also came out. That's what I tried also to say with the kind of bottom up. It came out of certain way of living. It's not that they were trying to, I don't know, break some rules and so on. Maybe at certain point this became, uh, or maybe that became some kind of, interpretation self-interpretation uh, but um, it was a manifestation of a certain way of life and attitude towards authorities uh, and it was clear no to authorities <laughs> of whatever kind yeah uh, risking also to not to be taken seriously that's also very important to say and i think that's another quality like if you are really radical you risk also not to be taken seriously or taken at all and so on. You know? And I think uh, that was very, uh, very clear. And also, interestingly enough, uh, it is true that there are traces of uh, Pupilia in the work of uh, Dusan Jovanovic, the director and playwright and so on. Uh, So there are traces, but you cannot really say that there was like development or uh, <clears throat> practice that uh, no one of those, any one of those uh, makers would actually continue. So basically it was, as I said, there were two more performances, but uh, with, without an impact and relevance because they were made from different uh, also premises and, and so on. Other, on other um, works around it? Like, can you see? Yeah, hmm. yeah. I mean, uh, um, the director, Dusan Jovanovic, he made another uh, show that was 
also kind of uh, cutting edge and uh, became uh, uh, very referential. Uh, and I decided also to reenact, re that could be called reenactment re mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, uh, Monument G was done in 1971. And uh, I could call it reenactment because I have also approached it in a completely different way. So <clears throat> uh, in the original show, there was one performer and a musician, like an actress and a musician. That was the cast. And uh, I wanted actually to do a parallel show of two people from original cast being on one part of the stage and two people, musician and a performer, on another part of the stage. And those two people were born after the show was uh, made and basically had no relation uh, to it. So it was completely different uh, kind of work. Uh, yeah. So uh, also with this, somehow I wanted to um, affirm this kind of practice um, and also somehow to, um, yeah, to bring it back, these questions, as I said initially, why is this, why this appear to be an excess in, uh, in history and not something that we can actually learn, get inspired, develop. Uh, why do we, why do we like basically hide this uh, uh, somewhere? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I see. In somehow, I'm this the the description you made of the the, the very scene uh, where it take it has taken place. It might might help to to also to to understand the um, the difference be between between that time and this time. I would say now. Uh, when you were saying that this this was part of a um, of a lifestyle, or all or all this description you've made, um, so in that sense, inquiring into these artworks is also inquiring into that period and those forms of life. I would say I have um, uh, you, I, I have an, uh, one doubt. Um, this work was not explicitly confrontational, right? I mean, it's nothing like living theater. Like from a bodily perspective, from the way they approach the audience, from the very relation um, relationship they they stage with with people, and what how do they live, and how do what they want to say to people or not or don't want to say, or I don't know how would you um, uh, place it? So just, I mean, this is just for us to have an idea of the, even the. Um, the bodily tonus of people and all of this. Uh. Yeah, I think uh, it was a um, variety of uh, affects. Uh, it did not have a message, produced. an explicit message, right? No, I mean, to me, from, from this perspective or the perspective that I uh, uh, worked on it, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, the... the voice of people who didn't want to be marginal like sorry you know they are different uh, there are some voices that we can see in the cultural landscape and we want to add this one mm -hmm. and sorry if this is not part of uh, i don't know the menu that you like but we want to bring this uh, mm -hmm. and we will find a way and they found a way and they got a lot of um, uh, support in their generation because of the effect, like why should we? Be, why should we be? We, why should we stay quiet? Why? We have right to talk. There is no way that we cannot enter in public uh, life, and that is an affect uh, that was um, praised. And of course, they were not single voice in that direction, but they were very amplifying this moment because of theater, because of uh, uh, attention the theater had, because of, <clears throat> I don't know what, what kind of uh, reasons. Uh, yeah. And it was 
it was confront very confrontational, of course, when it comes to uh, I don't know some scenes. Nudity back then back then was not what it is today. Like it was. No, no, no. Of course, of course. I meant, I meant um, very con very confrontational. Not to talk about uh, uh, slaughtering of uh, of uh, no, uh, chicken. Uh, of course, I, I meant not confrontational, and they would would they shout at people and do people to do stuff. I, I mean, for, uh, I, I was meaning confrontational in this sense, uh, not yeah. in the sense of they were doing their stuff and people could either like it or not. Uh, I mean, no, no, in that sense, it was not like interactive. It was not uh, interactive. It was not challenging uh, in a kind of direct uh, uh, interactive. Uh, uh, way but i don't know there are records like they they performed uh in a kind of uh uh on a stage that was in the middle of uh of the audience and uh they reported me that it was uh very tough uh in one or two nights because they if they wanted to go off stage they had to pass the audience and audience was outraged with this uh uh last scene yeah okay and um maybe just to finish or to uh, before finishing um the relation to ritual the fact uh, i mean if you were doing this uh, in the middle of the people what was the relation is to to ritual practices yeah there was also you have to un you, you you just have to recall that <clears throat> uh, 60s are also like worldwide a uh, period of rediscovering uh, rituals, not only in local, but especially in uh, other cultures. And this affected very much in theater. Artaud's text became translated and wide, uh, widespread, and his influence became visible uh, in, in different theater uh, practices. Uh, I don't know how much of that knowledge uh, those people had. I don't think uh, uh, very, very much. But yeah, there were two, three uh, scenes that one could uh, take as ritual uh, or ritualistic scene or scenes of, uh, <clears throat> of ritualistic flavor. Uh, so I think... This is important, uh, important part. Yeah, when it comes, yeah, when, when, uh, and then it's, it's also a question how rituals are placed. And this is interesting, uh, how rituals are placed in, uh, in contemporary, uh, in, let's say, liberal democratic uh, societies, because there is, uh, there is something that is challenging our liberal democratic uh, attitudes and perspective. Uh, in in uh, rituals, yeah? and for example, in the law uh, that uh, I mentioned and that uh, uh, treats uh, the way how uh, you deal with uh, animals when you uh, slaughter them, this becomes uh, very clear, including in the constitution, in the constitutional law, uh, <clears throat> where slaughtering of chicken. Uh, is reserved for uh, slaughterhouses. So you can basically slaughter animals either in slaughterhouse or at home in case you have animals at home and you will use them uh, for uh, food at home. Uh, and then uh, there are some exceptions and they relate to science. So for some scientific uh, reasons and rituals. So <clears throat> rituals are wel welcome, and not only welcome, but also protected uh, on a kind of legisla uh, legislative uh, level. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. I had last, last, last question, and then I will end it, which is the relation to media, namely TV, and I mean, all these 20 scenes. And uh, yes, so how do you see it in, in this, how it informs this uh, proposal or something? You mean uh, the, the, the form of the performance or 
the structure, the form, yes. Uh, of the original in, performance. Uh, we have in, in the image behind you, you have it, a little TV. How, in, how would this 69 performance uh, uh, reflect, uh, uh, I don't know, had to do with the, the, this uh, massification of images uh, that's going on? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And also, again, something that is very difficult to understand from today's point of view. Uh, you know, for example, uh, when the television started, it was only one program. It was, you know, different in different countries, but it started with one program. So that's the thing. There is a box from which only one thing uh, uh, could be uh, seen. And when it comes to, uh, for example, uh, news or political uh, program, Basically, that became kind of altar in people's houses. You know, that's the, uh, and they related, uh, uh, Pupilia people, they related to television as a kind of altar. Like what is, you know, an altar is a kind of authority that is no go uh, for us. Uh, but they acknowledged uh, pretty much the presence and influence of uh, uh, television in popular culture and popular culture is um, something that is not uniform uni how can i say that has a uniform tendency but it's also can uh, create spaces for subverting uh mainstream and so on so i think they were pretty um uh pretty much enjoying uh the uh, conflict that television brought in uh, respect of other uh, authorities that were thinking they are single altars in uh, in people's life. You know. Okay. Well, we're approaching a hit. Um, I wonder, Yanesh, if there's something you would like to tell us from from all this. I mean from all this work with this reconstruction, from the fact that it has been done recently by a school in a, in a very different way, by the fact that we are still today asking you to talk about it. I don't know, is there any, is there anything you want to tell us or to say um, about all this? No, I'm really thankful uh, for your invitation. And also I think the interest that, uh, you are bringing into all these kind of practices uh, from different parts uh, of the world is very relevant uh, and also I would say very inspiring. Uh, I I learned actually about uh, Pupilia in a in more profound way in a lecture mm. that was uh, in a way eye opening because before that I had this kind of scandalous information. Uh, which was very poor and very one-dimensional. One uh, so I hope maybe there will be one who would uh, uh, find uh, this work uh, uh, relevant and uh, would leave some uh, traces and provoke some uh, interest in research in local context uh, somewhere else or place it some, in some other context that uh, we are, I am not aware of. Mm. No, I'm pretty sure. And actually, a lot of the questions you raised are questions I think we are still dealing with. Uh, thank you so much. And I said, thank you so much, everybody. Muito obrigada a todos. Chegamos então às oito. Muito obrigada. Sigam-nos nas redes do teatro do bairro alto.pt. Obrigada.